to the Wednesday evening services. We're so thankful that you are able to join us tonight. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and tune in to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter number 2 is where we're going to be at tonight. And I'd like to speak to you tonight on the simple thought of the road to humility. The road to humility. That unity is found in humility. The road to unity is paved with humility. And we're going to be talking about unity among the brethren, unity within a church body, but not just unity as it relates to within the church, although that's kind of the primary context of what we're looking at tonight. I want you to notice with me that this principle of unity and the idea of humility and, and being associated with it, that that is relevant to every relationship in life and so many various situations in life, and we'll touch on some of those tonight as well. But Philippians chapter number 2 Beginning in verse number one, Paul says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for allowing us to get together tonight around the word. And Father, I just want to pray and I just want to ask that you might guide and direct through the lesson tonight. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and work in our lives as we think about this idea and this matter of unity and of humility. And Lord, we have a great example that is given to us as well that we're going to look at next time in verses 5 through 11. But Lord, I think about the, the desire that Paul has as he communicates to this dear church, the design that you have in mind as you inspired Paul to write these things to them. And God, we just pray that you'd help us to be unified one with another in humility. God, I pray that you fill my mouth now with your words. Please help me as I endeavor to communicate the lesson tonight. And God, help our hearts to be tender and teachable, that we might receive that which you would desire to say to us. And we'll thank you so much for that. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The circulatory system, also called the cardiovascular system or vascular system, is an organ system that permits blood to circulate and transport nutrients, nutrients such as amino acids and electrolytes, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones, and other blood cells to and from the cells in the body, thus providing nourishment and helping them to fight diseases, stabilize temperatures and pH balances, and maintain what is called homeostasis. The essential components of the human cardiovascular system are the heart, the blood, and the blood vessels. That also includes the pulmonary circulation. We might call it this a loop where the blood and the arteries carry things through the lungs and where blood is oxygenated and the, the systemic circulation, a loop through the rest of the body to provide the oxygenated blood via the arteries and capillaries and veins and so on. Now blood consisting of plasma and red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets are also Helping, helping and, and being conveyed through the lungs and throughout the body to communicate and to carry and provide the nutrients that the system needs and thus being pumped by the heart. And while it's not our purpose to have a first year med class tonight for our Wednesday evening services, and while I'd probably be the last person that would be qualified to speak on such matters as that, something that I wanna just point out as we think about this simple illustration is the unity that is found in the circulatory system. Uh, the circulatory system, the cardiovascular system, is a very intricate system that God has designed and created. But notice that as we observe and watch the function of it and the unity of it, such amazing things are accomplished. We think about the movement of our body, we think about the health of our body, all of these different things and so much more is accomplished and achieved through the unity of this system. And every moment of every day, our body is essentially beneficiaries of the health of our cardiovascular system and the movement thereof. Much is achieved when things act in harmony one with another 
and in unity with our bodies. And that's true whether we're speaking of the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the digestive system, our nervous system, or any other system in our body, that when there's unity there in the body, that great health is enjoyed and great achievement takes place. Now, that isn't just true in a physical sense. It's also true in a spiritual sense as well as it relates to the spiritual man the new man, the the spiritual body of the local New Testament church. The passage here before us speaks to this idea of unity. And and while the first four verses is what we're going to focus on tonight, these four verses, they come in a much larger scope. Uh, Into verse 11, kind of this idea of unity is going to be spoken of and described here. And Paul, writing to this Philippian church, illuminates an important need within their church body. See, much of what we would find in the book of Philippians speaks of joy, speaks of uh, uh, all of these wonderful things. Paul is very thankful for them, for their testimony. But here in this passage, we we see an illumination, if you would, a hitting on an issue that not just this church, but many churches and many individuals face in their lives. And that is the matter of unity. It's a problem that's faced in people's lives based in churches' lives, based in marriages' lives, in family lives. The married couples, husbands and wives, deal with this issue of unity in their marriages at times. Families uh, deal with this idea of a disunity in their house at times, where individuals don't see eye to eye on things. So sometimes it's between a parent and a child. Sometimes it's between siblings. Uh, Nevertheless, those struggles exist. Furthermore, relationships in general have times where there's a struggle with unity. Sometimes it's a struggle for uh, unity not being sought after at all, or even it being early abandoned. Or maybe a couple might say, uh, people might say, well, we tried that, it just didn't work. And they tried it for every bit of five minutes, or every bit of one day. And then after that, poof, I guess it didn't work, I don't see my instant results, and so I'm abandoning that. Yet in this passage of Scripture, we're meant to learn a simple and timeless truth regarding unity and the nature of unity. We find that achieving unity with the brethren, achieving unity with people, it comes through humility. Because as Paul will demonstrate and show to them, humility of the mind helps to achieve unity amongst brethren. And so here's the challenge for you and for me. As we consider this passage of Scripture, as we look at it, and as next week we'll look at verses 5 through 11 and the tremendous example of the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul puts forth, that his mindset, his way of thinking, the humility of his mindset, and all of what was accomplished as a result of it, our challenge is to endeavor to be humble. Endeavor to be humble in order to be unified. In order to be humble, endeavor to be humble, rather, in order to be unified. Now, three components stand out to us from this text. The first component dealing with the motivation of unity. What what should motivate an individual to be unified? Secondly, we'll look at the component of the manifestation of unity. What does it look like? How is it expressed? And then lastly, we'll see the movement there of unity as well, where when we think about actions and and, and actual movement and, and how it's spelled out, we'll see that as well. So verse number one, we find firstly a pattern for the motivation. As we think about the motivation itself, Paul writes to them and says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. Now, notice here, Paul presents a wonderful pattern that should serve to motivate them in this matter of unity that he is presenting to them. The phrase, the consolation in Christ, refers to, the word consolation speaks of an encouragement of an admonition, of an exhorting, if you would. And he speaks of, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ. Uh, In other words, does Christ present any examples, any encouragement from uh, what he has done that we might see and lay hold of and be admonished by, instructed by, that we could lay hold of? Well, we would say absolutely. Verses 5 through 11 clearly speak of that, and we're going to speak more to that next week. Nevertheless, something that Paul is hinting at, and it is not necessarily that he's so much asking them a question of, do you, do you see any of this? Uh, the answer is, so, is very much self-evident, that yes, 
There is consolation in Christ. There is clearly examples that Christ lived out that we might follow after, that these Philippian believers might be able to follow after, and to be able to clearly follow a pattern in order to live unified, not only one with another, but as I, I hope to show you, unified around the purpose of Christ, unified around the will of God, unified around what God would have them to be doing. We see here that Paul is drawing their minds to contemplation, to contemplating the fact that Christ, who is their Savior, through his own examples, exhorts them. He admonishes them, yea, he encourages the believer, and by extension the church, to live in a state of unity, to be unified one with another, that, to not constantly be at strife one with another, to not constantly be bickering one with another, to not necessarily be fighting over things that really don't matter, but rather to be unified around the truth, to be unified around the purposes of God, and to endeavor to live unified for the Lord and about the service of the Lord. Paul speaks of the pattern for motivation, but also he hints at the persuasiveness in the motivation as well. Look in again in verse number one. He continued by saying, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, that, that phrase comfort of love, it, it describes a very persuasive address. You say, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. Love is certainly a very comforting thing. When you sense it, when you feel it, when you know that it's present, it can be a very calming thing, a very comforting thing. At the same point in time, the, the tenderness and affection that's manifested through love can be a very persuasive thing. Because you know that somebody loves you, you're willing to do certain things for them. You're persuaded by love to do some things. There's a comfort that love brings. Furthermore, though, we think of hatred. The opposite of that, what does hatred produce? What produces misery, not comfort. We think about, however, the comfort and joy that love brings and produces in a life. The presence of love is a very persuasive thing. And notice that Paul is he's, he's endeavoring to help point to this love that they're meant to have. Notice the love for the Lord and also a love that is meant to be manifested for one another as a basis to persuade them. Here, be unified, one with another. You love the Lord, yeah? Well, you love one another? Well, sure, well, let's get along together then. Let's be unified, one with another, in our behavior, in our actions, in our attitudes, and in our mindset, and our thinking, as we'll see, for the Lord and the things of God. For, furthermore, Christ's love was certainly manifested in them, and as we'll see, for them, in what he did in verses 5 through 11. That again, the manifestation, the example that we're going to look at, the, the mindset that Christ had and the motivating factors of Christ are clearly examined and given for us as an example in verses 5 through 11. It was self-evident, but nevertheless, it was meant to motivate them. And so we see persuasiveness in their motivation, but we further see a partnership in the motivation as well, because Paul continues in verse number one by mentioning, if any fellowship of the Spirit, that term fellowship, again, it speaks of a partnership. It describes that which is common between two or more. If you have fellowship with somebody, it means that you have things in common and that you share in that commonality that, in other words, you're taking, you're partaking together of something. And the idea here is that among them, he speaks of if any fellowship in the Spirit, because they were both believers, because that as individuals they were believers in Jesus Christ, that they had some things that were in common, that they had some things that they would that they would partake of together amongst themselves. In other words, the Spirit of God would be working in each of their hearts to produce the fruit of His Spirit. That, that as a result, they could not help but share in some of those things, in the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the temperance, the meekness, the temperance, the faith, all of those different things that Christ's Spirit would produce through them and in their lives, they would share in those influences and participate in those influences of the Spirit of God in their life. And by this fact, Paul says he's exhorting them, he's challenging them to be unified in love and in zeal, and so live their lives that they might serve and honor God in unity. There's partnership for the motivation. 
But notice the fourth thing, and that is this passion in the motivation as well. Because Paul ends the verse by saying, if any bowels and mercies. Now the bowels in that day and time and in that culture and that mindset it was looked upon as the seat of the emotions. Much like today we would say, I love you with all my heart. But we're speaking not necessarily of the blood pumping organ, neither were they necessarily speaking so much of the actual intestines, but rather of the seat of the emotions where the feelings were originating from. And notice here that, that Paul speaks of this idea of if any bowels and mercies, mercies would speak of compassion. They would describe emotions, longings, manifestations of pity, and such the like. That, that notice here, Paul in, in essence is drawing on a passion as a motivating factor for unity that he's going to require them, that he's going to reveal to them is God's design for them as individuals, as a church, and as we'll see, as families and marriages and whatnot. Uh, essentially, Paul is, is asking them, if you have any affectionate regard for me, I'm going to ask you to do something. Uh, Paul is certainly revealing something that was present, in their lives, they undoubtedly felt much love and care for Paul. We know that by chapter 1, where we think about this gift that they had sent to him. Here's Paul, he's in jail, he's under house arrest, he's in prison, he, he is lacking freedom, he's needing things. And this church is looking at their missionary, they're looking at his need, and they're saying, you know what, we can do something to help. So they send Epaphras, Epaphroditus there, with this gift to minister to Paul. Why? Because they loved him. They cared about him. And so Paul isn't essentially asking a question in the sense where he stands in doubt of them, but rather he is insinuating, since these things exist, uh, the answers to each of these four things was self-evident. Of course they had that uh, consolation in Christ. Of course there was comfort of love. Of course there was fellowship of the Spirit. And of course there were bowels and mercies that they felt directly towards him. Each of these things was present, and with each of these considerations, Paul is presenting to them this matter and this need of, of unity. Because salvation certainly had furnished these things in their life, and thus they were meant to live in unity with him. It wasn't a matter of so much if they were present, but since they were present, Paul is assuring them and using gentle means to help communicate to them, let's be unified because of it. Uh, again, we're hinting at a problem that the church was struggling with. And more specifically, as we read on in the narrative, we would find two specific ladies that had an issue of being unified one with another. And likely Paul was speaking to them directly, although gently, but then also using them as an example to say to the rest of the church, hey, we ought to live in unity one with another. And certainly as we consider the church at Philippi and their motivation for unity, it reminds us that we, too, ought to be motivated to be unified. I'm talking about as a church body. I'm talking about as couples that are married. I'm talking about as families and family units. That we look at the relationships of our life and we look at Halstead Baptist Church and we think to ourselves, as a church family, God desires and designs that we would be unified. Can I just say that there are always forces at work? which tend to part or separate even the most closely knit unities, that, that there is always going to be something that can be allowed and could be allowed and sometimes is allowed to break up the unity and the fellowship that exists in between individuals that know the Lord. If we're not careful, we'll allow those things to come in. We'll, we'll allow those things to uh, separate us as believers, one from another, and, and cause us to be ununified and, and live in states of disunity, one with another, and thus not honor Christ, not accomplish the will of Christ, not know the oneness that God desires that we would have. We have a pattern for motivation, and that is the consolation of Christ. Now notice, Christ and the exhortations of Christ certainly ring out throughout the Word of God, loud and clear in our minds in regard to this matter of unity. Jesus told his disciples, first of all, of the unity that he had with God the Father when he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. 
Now, the, the disciples are, are approaching Jesus. He had been at the well talking with the woman. She leaves her water pot and she runs off. And they're standing there. They brought lunch. And, and they're wanting Jesus to eat something. And Jesus essentially is telling them there's something more important that's going on right now. And here he reveals this unity that he had with the Father. That his meat was to do the will of him that sent me. In other words, my desire is to be unified with the Father and to accomplish his work. That what God the Father desires of me is more important than anything else. And that there was a unity that existed between God the Father and God the Son. And the work that Christ was accomplishing. He was totally unified with the will of and with the way of the Lord. And, and, and we'll see that even to a greater degree in these following verses, that he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. No matter how difficult it got, no matter how severe it might have been, Christ says, I'm willing to go all the way because that's what the Father desires in unified, living in unity with the will of God. What a tremendous reality that, be, that we are able to be also in unity with God. Because we're in unity with Christ. Christ prayed in the garden for us to be united not only with him, but with God the Father. John chapter 17, verse number 21. Christ would pray that they all may be one. Even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He's speaking of unity here. In these verses, in this great high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, verse number 22, Christ would say, And the glory which thou gavest me have I given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Again, unity amongst the brethren. That mirrors the unity that exists between God the Father and God the Son, the persons of the Godhead. Moreover, he would go on to say this, I in them, thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Again, he speaks of a great unity. That is possible because of our unity with Christ. So we have a pattern for motivation, that consolation for Christ, that example, that exhorting, that admonishing, where Christ himself says, you ought to be unified. My desire, my design for you is to live in unity. We have also that which ought to persuade us to motivation. And that love is certainly a very comforting thing. We, we love God. Well, as we've been finding in our series in the Gospel of 1 John, that if we love God, we ought to love the brethren. We can't say, I love God, and then hate those that God loves. That's, that's, we're lying. We're deceiving ourselves. We're doing not the truth. And yet we find here that there's a motivation of love, a comfort of love, if you would, that as we love the Lord, we ought to love others, and love the brethren, and as we love others, we ought to endeavor to live in unity. We're persuaded, we're motivated in that way, out of love, to live in unity about the purposes of God. We've got a partnership that encourages us and enables us to be motivated. How exciting, a power source, that, that through his dependence, through dependence upon him, we are able to manifest the unity that God desires. The presence of God's Holy Spirit in us is meant to shine forth from us in unity. And again, it's not something that we specifically work up or, or are able to manifest in and of our own strength, but rather the Spirit of God through us is able to produce it. That He's able to bring it about, but we've got to rest in Him. We've got to depend upon Him. But the Spirit of God works in our lives to produce fruit that will bring glory and honor to God. And we could cite many passages of Scripture, but we just... Look back in Galatians chapter 5 and that fruit of the Spirit. And what does God produce? We can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and think about that love and the aspects of Christ-centered love and, and the Spirit of God manifesting love in and through us. But we look at it and we notice that the Holy Spirit of God is at work in our lives to help bring about the will of God, to guide us into all truth, to help us to empower us to accomplish God's will. And there's a need for us to recognize the partnership that not only encourages us, but at the same point in time enables us to be motivated, to be unified. We've got a passion that compels us to be motivated again. Jesus would tell his disciples, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
And as believers, there's that natural bond that should exist, that does exist, which ought to lend itself to unity in the local New Testament church. We're fellow believers. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ that we are able to honor and serve and live for God together. And so there's that passion that ought to compel us to serve God by being unified one with another. So we see this first component, this motivation that is spoken of, a motivation for unity. A second component that we find is in verse number two, and that is the manifestation of unity. What does unity produce? What ought, it, what ought we to find? Paul says, fulfill ye my joy. And what he's implying is, is that I will be greatly pleased. I will be joyful if you will be unified. That Paul hints to them, and in fact, he doesn't merely hint, but he rather tells them, hey, listen, if you will do this, that will really please me. That will really bring joy to my heart, the satisfaction to my soul. And what rich imagery of filling up my joy, the, the idea of making replete so that there's no room for anything is that Paul would say, I would be full of joy, full of excitement, full of thankfulness, that, that their union of zeal and humility, that it would cause Paul to be overjoyed at that. Why? Because of the work that then would be accomplished for God's glory. And again, what rich imagery, where Paul isn't just the one speaking here, these are the very words of God that God is trying to communicate to them that unity brings joy to the Lord. That unity is that which would cause the heart of God to overflow with joy. If they would be centered upon that aspect of being unified one with another, again, around the purposes and plans of God, it would cause great joy to Paul, but it would also cause great joy for the Lord. There's a joy that's manifested through unity, but there's also a job. That is manifested as well. That Paul continued by stating in fact, emphatically, not only that his joy would be fulfilled, but that it would be fulfilled in that they would ye would be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And so now Paul is hinting at, he's not hinting at, rather, he's instructing and he's explaining this is the job that brings about unity. This is what helps produce it. The, this is the work that is presented for, before us to do, and that is the work of being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And the idea of like-mindedness speaks of to agree together. It carries the thought of cherishing the same views, the same ideals, the same goals, the same direction, as well as communicating a state of living in harmony and being harmonious one towards another. And therefore, having established these conditions in the previous verse, he charges them to, to make and fulfill his joy by being like-minded. The job description that lay before them, furthermore, carried on the idea of having the same love, loving the same objects, having the same love one for another, uh, through though their opinions might differ on some points, yet they can be united in love. So you don't have to agree with somebody on every single solitary thing in order to walk in unity. In order to have the same love. Paul here is describing this idea of loving the same objects. We love the Lord. We want to see people saved. We love the Word of God. We want to walk in truth and in obedience with God. And, and, and other things that we could talk about tonight. But nevertheless, the idea of having the love for the things that God loves. Having a desire for the things that God desires. He speaks of being of one accord. The, the phrase speaks of having one soul or having the souls joined together. And being knitted together. That, that it, almost like you would glue something together never to be separated again. Being of one accord, this word here doesn't occur elsewhere in the New Testament. And it speaks of the unity of the soul and the acting of one together as if one soul was all that it was. That, that we think about such unity and one accord where it, that there's just this, the same movement, the same thought, the same desire. They're, they're headed in the same direction, doing the same things. He then again says, 
of one mind. Again, thinking the same thing. And while he's used a variety of expressions to describe the same thing, that the idea of unity there, he's wanting them to recognize the totality of the person that is meant to be unified in every way possible. Live in unity with God and with one another. Paul's great desire, God's great design, that would wish that they would avoid all divisions and strifes and to show forth Christ's power through faith being united about the common cause that God had given them. And there's probably no single thing that is so much insisted upon throughout the New Testament as unity, that we find example after example of it, but then we also see the danger of it when it's not present, and the discord that comes, and the dysfunction that results from it as well. The church at Corinth had a big problem with a lack of unity. And so we find here that the thought is, as Paul is writing to them, he's wanting them to see the importance of harmony in the church. That the context there is speaking of harmony in the church, humility in the church, as we'll see, but unity there that is present in the church. And certainly there's manifestations that signal that unity is achieved. We think about where unity is present, there will be true joy. That when we achieve unity, what are we going to find? We're going to find that there is going to be joy in uniting around God's purposes. That joy is going to flow forth from it. That it's not merely going to be something fake or something manufactured or something that fizzled here and there. But something that is deep and that is satisfying. A genuine joy. The greater thought, furthermore, is that as we're unified in the spirit and walking with God, we'll be unified in our mind. Solomon tells us that only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. And nothing kills joy faster in a church than pride and the presence of friction and division. You walk into somewhere and you can just tell, these people don't like each other. I mean, they're here, but they don't really care to be here. They're here because they have to be. You can sense it when you walk into the job and recognize that something just heated took place between two employees. You can sense it when you walk into a home and you see the look on the face of mom or dad or child or sibling or whatever, and you can just tell, okay, something's not as it should be. Nevertheless, Paul's plea to them and the reminder that joy will come as a result of it is that unity pleases God and unity provides joy not only to the heart of God, but also joy to others. Again, Paul says, my heart will be joyful. Fulfill ye my joy. Make me, we might say it this way, make me happy, be unified. Make me happy, get along. That we find here, the Bible tells us, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This is God's estimation of things. That God says, when brethren are dwelling together in unity, when they're of the same mind, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, that when that is present, that is a pleasant thing. That is an acceptable thing. That's a wonderful thing. Furthermore, unity is achieved when we do our job. That, that we achieve that, that as we accomplish the purpose of unity, as we work and endeavor to be like-minded and to do so with the right standard, which as we'll see is the mind of Christ, the word of God, that as we have that right standard and we unify ourselves around those things and endeavor to love the same things by loving what God loves and loving the God that loves those things, that something that we'll find is as we endeavor to be of one accord by endeavoring to be in step with God, all of this, again, is possible through our relationship with the Spirit of God. But as we do that, here's what we'll achieve. We'll achieve unity. We'll achieve single-heartedness, one-mindedness. The Spirit of God, through Jesus Christ, helps to provide those things. We see that second component is the manifestation of unity. Thirdly, observe with me the movement of unity. Because as Paul reveals this movement of unity, he speaks firstly to something that we're meant to avoid. Again, what kills unity faster than pride and the presence of friction and division that come as a result of it? So notice here, Paul says... He touches on the nerve of disunity. He says, if this, in other words, this will kill unity faster than anything else. Let nothing be done through strife 
or vain glory. President Harry Truman was once quoted as saying, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. But therein is the problem. We all want the credit. We do things because we want to be noticed. The natural tendency in man desires to receive praise, receive credit, receive accolades, uh, allow history to remember them as the one that figured it all out, that brought about the peace, that, that, that carried the day, that was victorious, that, that all of us want to be noticed and to be known. And Paul's challenge is to avoid that natural tendency in life. Paul's challenge here, he speaks to the active movement and purposeful avoidance of these things. Again, let nothing be done helps to demonstrate no, not one thing ought to be done with this attitude or this motivation that is being mentioned here that we'll see in these following ver verbs, words, strife or vainglory. Nothing, let nothing be done in this form, this fashion, for this purpose or in this way. The word translated as strife has the sense of self-seeking pursuit. You think about strife that pushes the way to the front of the line. Me first mentality. I want it now, and I don't care who I have to step over to get what I want. Strife, fighting, uh, endeavoring to achieve through unfair means. It, it further has the sense of uh, self-promotion and selfishness. And revealed is that there were some within the church at Philippi that really struggled with this tendency, through caught up in carnal pride, advancing themselves, desiring to be seen as some great one, to advance to the front, to, to be the one that was recognized in front of everybody else, and to receive the glory and the praise for all of what was taking place. Furthermore, in the letter, we're going to again mention these two women, and likely this was partly their problem. But again, Paul isn't just pointing to them, although he will point to them. He's pointing to other hearts as well and saying, inside of you is this tendency. It exists. Choose to avoid it. Choose to do everything you can to not do something through strife or because of strife or with the motivation of strife. Avoid that. Vain glory has the, the, the idea of empty pride. Self-esteem. Again, the idea of being lifted up. And, and, and Paul says, listen, you know, self-promotion and self-esteem and the idea of, of, it's just empty pride. The Bible would say, let another man praise thee and not thyself. Pride is pure. It, pride is, is this aspect of carnality and corruptness. And notice there, because of carnal pride, some within the church we're causing friction and a lack of unity. And Paul says, avoid that. Be on guard against that. Recognize that's your natural human tendency and seek to stay away from that. Movement towards unity means movement away from the strife and the vainglory. Why? Because all that's going to do is cause friction. All of that's going to do is cause disunity. All that is going to do is cause problems and strife. And so we ought to avoid that. Not only do we notice the avoidance in the movement, but we notice an attitude that ought to be moved towards in the movement as well. Paul continued by revealing an attitude that ought to characterize their movement, where he says, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now notice here that, that simple conjunction, but. Rather than do this, do this. He, he says, don't let this, don't, don't let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but, in other words, there's something different that you should do. In all lowliness, he says, of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I want you to think about not just a matter of don't do that, but rather also do this instead. Have a mindset that is totally different than your natural human tendency. That is foreign from the old man and the old ways that are corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
Paul speaks of this lowliness of mind, and with what is described here is humility of thinking, of a humbleness of our mindset, having a humble opinion of oneself, where you don't see yourself as all that in a bag of chips, where you don't see yourself as having a deep sense of, I am better than everybody else. I'm smarter, I know more, I'm better at this, and I'm better at that, and therefore I deserve the preeminence, and I deserve this and that. But rather, the humility that is being spoken of, the lowliness of mind, speaks of a humble opinion of oneself and a deep sense of one's own littleness. We're like Paul, you might say, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. To recognize that apart from Christ, I'm nothing. I have nothing. Uh, that, that we find here that Paul would say it in Romans this way, be kindly affection one to another, with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. The idea of esteeming other better than themselves essentially is being mindful that they are more important than I am, that their needs are more important than my needs, that, that, that Paul is looking, he, he's, he's describing this others-focused mentality that is meant to, to characterize their thinking. This is one of the effects that is produced by true humility, loneliness of mind, naturally causes others to esteem other better than themselves, to lift up others, to care about others, to endeavor to have a mindset and an attitude that considers others better and higher with regard to them than ourselves. It's the opposite of strife and vainglory. We see not only an attitude in the movement, but lastly, we see the action in the movement. Paul lastly challenges them, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And the idea is, stop focusing on number one, and start focusing on who you should be, on others. Again, selfishness is a natural human tendency in every person. And that doesn't get eradicated or go away when we get saved. Wouldn't that be nice? If all of a sudden, once we meet Christ and we get saved, just like that, we have that new man living in us, and that's the only man that's living in us. Now someday, that sin nature is going to be gone. The body of sin is going to be destroyed. We don't have to serve sin any longer, but notice we still struggle, we still war, don't we? The, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one to the other. That right now we still live in this body of flesh. It's coming a day when that will change. But notice here, rather than advancing ourselves, Paul says, seek to advance others. Seek to strengthen. And look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Care about other people before you care about yourself. Some of the Philippians in their church were exhibiting exactly the opposite. Because every man was trying to be first. Because every man was vying for position. Maybe not every man, but many. Strife and discord. Disunity was taking place. What is Paul trying to do? He's trying to help them to recognize God's desire and his design for you. Is to live in unity in the church body, in the church family. There's movement if we achieve unity. That, that when unity is achieved, there will be movement. If we are to achieve unity... There will be things that we must avoid as individuals. And again, that's true whether we're talking about a church body. It's true if we're talking about a unity in our marriage. It's true if we're talking about a unity with, between our, our children and us as parents or between siblings or between the parent-child. Uh, regardless of what end of the relationship we're talking about there, what side. The, the idea is that if we are to achieve unity, there are some things that we must purposefully choose to avoid. Firstly being pride. At the root of every sin is pride. You mark it down, you look back in Genesis, and you look at the first sin. That man committed, you see pride. You go to Isaiah, and you look at the first sin that ever happened in the heart of Satan. You find it was pride. Pride at the root of everything. That like the Philippians and other believers and people that have gone before us and that live in the world around us, there is a natural struggle within us that wants position and wants 
prominence and that deals with pride. If you're ever to be unified with someone else, if you're ever to live in unity as God intends for us to live in unity, you must be willing to deal with pride and allow the Spirit of God to deal with it in our life. We all are guilty at times of being self-promoters, of fishing for compliments, of even having a false humility to say, oh, shucks, it wasn't really all that good, because we want them to say, oh, really, it was. Oh, no, not really. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. We're all guilty of that. Paul says, put that away. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. The challenge is to choose to actively avoid the actions and the attitudes of strife and vain glory. See, what we need and what we ought to desire after is to live humbly with our God. To walk in humility and submission to His will. To achieve unity one with another. And to allow God's purposes to be expressly carried out in and through our lives. Notice secondly, if we are to achieve unity, there will be an attitude that we must be willing to possess and to nurture in our lives. Yes, don't be proud. But it's not just, I'm not proud. I am not proud. I am not proud. I'm not proud. Well, what are you? Be something else. Uh, we find here in our lives as Christians, we ought not merely to be defined as a list of things that we don't do, but, latter, uh, latter, uh, but, but also we ought to be characterized by qualities and attributes of what we do. We find here the book of Galatians is rich with instructions regarding the importance of walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. The book of Ephesians, likewise, is rich with practical instructions regarding the putting off of the old man and the putting on of the new man. And here in Philippians, we see rich imagery regarding the humility that is needed as a means of achieving that unity. Again, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, in humility. You know, how you achieve unity is through humility. Of having the right mindset, as we'll see here, is the mindset of Christ. But there is actions that we must be willing to carry out. Actions that are focused not inward, but outward. Actions that are focused on our care being to minister to others. To endeavor to meet the needs of others before our own. To endeavor to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. To endeavor to be others focused and to be about God's will. Loving God, loving others. Well, who's going to take care of me? Let God worry about that. If everybody else is other-focused, if we're endeavoring to serve God, not caring who gets the credit, if we're endeavoring simply to love God and live for God and love others, you'll be taken care of. And you'll be taken care of in the way that you need. It's all about achieving unity with the brethren through humility. Humility of mind helps us to achieve unity with the brethren. And again, it not only relates to a church body, Although it relates to a church body. We find that this imagery also relates to the relationships of life. You think about a marriage again. Husbands and wives need to live in unity. Parents and children need to live in unity. Siblings need to live in unity. Friendships and other relationships are benefited and blessed. And thrive and survive because of a unity. Unity that is being spoken of aids each of these areas of life and many more to function as God intends that they truly should, and thus to produce from those relationships that which will bring glory and honor to God. It allows us to carry out God's true and intended purpose and honor and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and the tremendous difference that He brings in our life. And furthermore, it produces abiding joy. You want to know people that are truly joyful? They're people that are at peace and in unity one with another. Strife, hatred, variance, anger, all those kind of things, resentment, bitterness, that's not unity. And nobody has true and satisfying joy that lives that way. We find that there's a tendency in life to allow things to hinder unity. We, we understand that there will always be forces at work which tend to part the most closely knit Unities, and yet 
being on guard in that regard, and endeavoring by the help of God to live in a unified fashion. Here's what you're able to do. You're able to live in unity with one another. Much is achieved when things act in harmony and unity within our bodies. I'm talking about the physical body. Think about that circulatory system again. When everything's just flowing along and working like it should. When the heart's pumping in rhythm like it should, it's a beautiful thing. When you actually have circulation, it's more than just one fuzzy feeling. It's, it's health in the body. And what a blessing when we think about the reality that when the body functions as it should, when the systems of the body, whether it be respiratory, circulatory, digestive, nervous, or any other systems, when they work in unity one with another, much is achieved and great health is experienced. And while that's true in a physical body, it's true in a spiritual one as well. God, by uh, the Spirit, is speaking and inspiring Paul to write these words and to remind the church at Philippi, and down through time, through by way of application and ethical instruction, reminding us that we ought to continuously be challenged and endeavor to be humble. Humble that we might live in unity, one with another. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have to be in unity with you and with one another. God, your desire and your design is that we would live in unity one with another. Yet so often, things come into our life that attempt to disrupt that. Lord, help us to recognize that there are some things, strife and vainglory, that we ought to try to avoid. While at the same point in time, there are things that we ought to endeavor to advance attitudes of loneliness in mind, humility, that are meant to be nurtured. Think about how humility is not natural in a person's life. It's something that the Spirit of God brings about, something that we allow you to produce in our lives. But oh, the benefits and the blessing. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. God, we certainly need your grace. When we choose to yield ourselves to your will, we used to humble ourselves before you receive grace. Grace to accomplish what you would desire to see done. That would bring glory and honor to you. I pray that you would work in our midst and help us to be unified in our lives. That you might bring glory and honor to yourself in and through it all. Lord, as we think about the great example of Christ and the mindset that he had and the submission that he lived his life in, Lord, I pray that you would help us to so endeavor to live our lives with that kind of a mindset, with that kind of a thinking that would help cause us to live in unity and to accomplish your purposes. Bless the church tonight. Bless your people, we pray. Help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.